So Seamus, I hear there's new computer stuff going on at your place. It, there is indeed, Paul. Uh, my son Isaac is building a new PC as we speak. This is something he's been planning for a long time. He's still, he, like way back in, I think it was like 2011, 2012, um, the Olsen brothers donated a computer to me, um, Clinton Peter donated yeah. a donated a machine and uh i used that up until i think last year and uh then i passed the olsen machine on to isaac so the the machine he's using now is almost a decade old so that is a that has had a long and distinguished service for a computer that's really impressive yeah absolutely and it's not even terrible now but it's a you know it is a 10 year old computer and it's, you know, it, it, uh, it struggles with video editing and hmm. he's re and he's really been like the one thing he's been really looking forward to is a, he wants to play Minecraft modded Minecraft with like the ray tracing or the, not, not necessarily ray tracing, but the, the fancy shaders, you know, the, right, right. And, uh, his old computer, you know, the, computer he's been using isn't up for that particular challenge so that that's what he wants to do with the new P pc is he had to update his pc so he can play minecraft <laughs> a game that's 10 years old okay a game, a game oh my it's even older than the computer yeah so um so good luck to him he he did all the research on his own you know i didn't help him with this he's building it himself the whole thing paid for it himself building it himself cool it's exciting big step yeah first first build first pc build is always kind of a i don't know it's it's easier now than it was in the old days but it's still uh it's still a big step yeah right so do, do you have specs on it or is that still in, in flux? oh the specs okay See, the thing is, I am so out of touch with hardware these days that the specs don't mean much to me. Like, he's got an AMD Ryzen 5 processor. Is that mm -hmm. good? I, is I he using at integrated it graphics or he's got his own... He's going to have a graphics card he, too, right? Yeah, he's taking... He's keeping the graphics card he's been using, which I forget. It was the one I had before I got this machine. So it's it's not bad. It's not a ray tracing card or anything, but it's... It's decent. It's like three years old, I think. Hmm. It, it can definitely... I mean, I was using it to play... Yeah, yeah. Uh, to play AAA games with no problem before I upgraded. So, I get confused now because I look at this processor and I'm like, CPU speed? 1,600 gigahertz? Wait, what? That doesn't... It's either 1.6 gigahertz, which is too slow, or 1,600 megahertz... But, 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 so what is the, and then down below it says, um, frequency 3.6 gigahertz. And so like the specs make no sense to me. What <laughs> is CPU 1,600 gigahertz? That makes no sense. Um, and it says processor count two. And I'm like, wait a minute. The machine he has is like a four core machine. So Two pro but then below it says it's got six cores. I, I, I literally do not understand the specs. <laughs> like, they make no sense to me. Right. I do not know what any of this means. And I'm sure, like, if you keep up with hardware tech, this makes sense to you. You're like, oh, no, that's not what that means. You, you, this number is used for something else. But to me, it's just gibberish. It's like equivalent processor speed compared to whatever the benchmark is or something right he uh he got processor motherboard and memory all I mean, he's he's not getting a memory upgrade he's gonna have the same amount of memory 16 gigabytes of memory so like that's an interesting but the frequency thing. is probably higher oh i'm sure but that's an interesting thing a decade newer and you have the same number that wouldn't happen if the decade was going from 1992 to 2002 no then you're gonna wouldn't. have like <laughs> then you're gonna have like a hundred times more memory or something <laughs> but yeah, yeah same yeah. 
same size memory. That's very. This is a very interesting plateau we're on now. I I actually really appreciate it. It is so nice not buying a a new computer every three years. Yeah, yeah. I remember well, back when I was in college and stuff. You know, you'd buy a new computer and it'd be way behind the curve, and five years would be way behind. Right. You get a year of having the latest and greatest, a year of having, hey, that's an okay PC. Then you get a year of, oh, this thing's really kind of slow. And then it, then you can have the, if you want to push it even further, you can have the one year of, oh God, this machine, I need to replace it. This is horrible. The new version of Windows takes a day and a half to start up. <laughs> and I can't right. run half the stuff. Right. The operating system is always eating more and more more and more real estate in your hard drive and your memory and your processor and pretty soon it just won't run at all. It's like, oh, I got to go to Linux or upgrade to my OS or something. Right. But that's not that's not the deal. Now you can use a computer for a decade. That's pretty good. I think we're at a good point. Computers are still getting faster, but you know, it would like replacing a computer every two years is just so disruptive. Um, it's much nicer. Once a decade feels much more reasonable. Sure. You know, get a new car, new computer, roughly the same amount of right. time. Right. New house. Uh, new spouse. <laughs> you know, oh, oh, this one's no. getting a little old. <laughs> Gotta get somebody a little richer and a little better looking. I remember in Werner Vinge's uh, The Peace War, I think it was, uh, he talks about, he's always fascinated with the um, the singularity, technological singularity. and But it's interesting, he talks about like the all the hardware getting faster and faster, but also getting longer and longer lived, like, like more robust, um, more durable. And so there's like right. some people from like, you know, five years before the singularity and their equipment is like all broken and they have kids, like they're always maintaining it and stuff. And then they've got like the guy with the, you know, the stuff that's from like one month before the singularity and it's like super fast and like just lasts forever. And, you know, it's perfect in every way. It's kind of interesting. It's like, usually there are trade-offs there, right? Where you've got like the sports car, but you're always taking it into the, the shop or you've right. got like, you know, the old beater that just runs and runs and runs, you never put oil in it or anything. Right. It just keeps going. Um, but sometimes things are just better. Right. Yeah, this is just straight upgrade. It is better. It's not just, it's not like, well, it's faster, but it's more expensive or it's faster, but it won't last as long. It's just, yeah, straight up better across the board. Better, faster, longer lasting, cheaper. It's pretty amazing. Well, speaking of the future, uh, there's a project, I think I mentioned on the diecast a few months ago, maybe like four or five months ago, that um, a friend of mine has been doing. He's a blender guy. He does visual effects and things. And this is like this passion project he's been working on for a while now. I'm, I'm like I'm like a decade, a while kind of thing. And uh, so he's he's finally released the first episode of the reboot of his thing. And it's basically just an excuse to like do visual graphic, you know, special effects stuff. Um, but it is really a treat. And uh, I, don't know, I just wanted to mention that it's there also because I'm technically contributing to it a little bit and uh, my sister also contributed a little bit to it. So we're in the credits and it's fun to see that kind of come out and, uh, you know, and be a, a hit. It's uh, it's really it's really quite a trip watching the thing. So I don't know if you got a chance to watch it before the show. Uh, I am watching it actually right now. And um, yeah, it's some neat. I know nothing about it. And um. But wait, I recognize this woman with the with the ponytail. I've seen her riding that that shot of oh look, somebody made this entire movie set in Blender, and it shows her riding like an elevator up. Is this the same project? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that was the the trailer for this episode, basically. And that shot is in in later in. It's I think in like minute fourteen or something. So what did you what did you contribute? I made the subway map that's got all the names of all the stops and stuff and shows up in like in one shot but i think he also used that in order to like make a bunch of other subway stuff you know like signs and things right oh wow this just looks yeah this looks uh 
Um, no, I, I'm watching it muted, but wow, it looks just so amazing. You can't tell what's real, what's a set, and what's CGI. Is any of this, uh, yeah. is any of it real? Right. Uh, I mean, obviously the outdoor shots of this horribly, this is like cyberpunk steampunk. There's, it's like cyberpunk only like more dirty with less. Yeah. Neon. Yeah. It's like, um. Kulan walled city cyberpunk futurism kind of yeah, this doesn't look like oh boy I wish I lived in this cool cyberpunk thing. It's like oh wow this looks uh this looks rough Right <laughs> these people are not doing great, but oh, oh wow and the cinematography is really beautiful, too the, the a, at the two and a half minute mark there's a shot of her cutting plants and um she's got really rich orange lighting in a room with a lot of purple light in it. That is something I used to love to do back in the day. Like at Active Worlds, I first discovered that I was playing around with colored lighting in our engine. We just added that and I just added it, I guess. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, what happens? <laughs> orange light and purple fog. And then it looked amazing. And I started screwing around with that for like, I was obsessed with it for a month. And for for months and uh i still get a thrill whenever i see orange and purple used like that that is a really cool shot he's yeah anyway he's, he's a director he's directed a movie before and he's done like he's been a visual effects supervisor so he's just like he's a, a one-man band of visual effects and and uh yeah it, one of the things i really love about ian hubert's style is that he he throws stuff away he's just like here's this two second shot and there's like this huge right. amount of detail in it and all these, you know, unique assets and all this stuff. And he's just like, eh, it was easy. It was, it, it makes you feel like he was shooting there and he's just like, oh, well, here's this bit of environmental, you know, I just got this little shot while I was waiting for the crew to set up lighting somewhere else. But it like, he didn't because he had to make all of that, but he, he portrays it and edits it as if it was just this, you know, this in incidental thing. Right. You see this problem in, uh, early video games and um, also in like anime somebody will spend a lot of time on something and they're like we spent so long on this I want to get the most use out of it so the camera will just linger on it but the audience doesn't care right <laughs> they're like it's cool but I don't need to look at this for a minute and a half and uh, yeah to have that to have the ability to throw something away to just yeah I needed that for two seconds. Sure, it, it took a week and a half to make, but I only needed two seconds, and that's what made the most sense. Um, right. That's actually there's a, a scene in there a where there's discipline. a guy with like a robot, a robot arm, and he's doing stir fry, and like the whole scene is CG, and it's and it looks it's just seamless. And there might be some real elements in the background or something, but like it's just this beautiful. CG scene and then on the little monitor in the scene there's like a sports game playing and the sports game is like he made a whole sequence for the sports game and he got like all caught up in it and so he spent like a month making this little thing that shows up for like two seconds <laughs> on the monitor in the in this shot it, it's just like oh my goodness like this is why it takes you three years to make this you know but right uh, it, that just takes so much discipline to just accept that all this work gets so little attention even though as an artist you just want everybody to see all the stuff that you made it's like if you yeah. spent weeks making this giant painting but then people only see it from a hundred yards away yeah yeah it's he's he's an incredible artist and i uh, i really admire his yeah his ability to to make that kind of stuff and like to be able to wrap his head around, like you said, the editing and the and the directing and the camera motion and the the visual language of cinema is just he, he loves it and he's so good at it. Well, that is really fun. I will have a link to it. it will be I'll have it embedded in the show notes for anybody who wants to watch it. What fun! So I have a project out too. Yes, the video for what is it? The is that going to be the trailer for your book, or is it uh, one yeah. of the trailers? No, that's that's it. I made I made a video on Mass Effect Two, and that was my promotion for the book. So that's it. The book is out. Friggin' buy it already. <laughs> 
I, uh, I'm happy with how it turned out. I'm, well, I'm not totally happy. Um, as of this recording, um, the footnotes aren't working for people in the ebook version. The one place you'd want, you'd expect footnotes to just work where you click on them and they appear and then you click away and they go away without you having to lose your spot on the page. Yeah. But, um, uh, that is Amazon's fault. It like takes all that in, in using their preferred format. It takes all that information and throws it out and just puts all the footnotes at the very end of the document in one giant, like Silmarillion style index. So you hit a footnote <laughs> and it's just, you can't even click it to go there. You just have to remember, okay, what's footnote number 37? You go to the very end of the book, page through it, find, you know, that footnote, read it, and then go back to where you were. It's unusable on an e-reader. Absolutely unusable. Uh. Uh, but I have an update, so I'm going to update a book, and I'm going to update it with a different format. I don't know how much Amazon's going to appreciate that. Let, we're going to find out well, here on Sunday. The ebook has got to be, there's got to be a way to do that, right? Push an update out. Um, yeah, I mean, the site lets me do it, so I assume they have some way of getting updates to users. Well, that's unfortunate. Y you'd think... Amazon of all people would have that figured out. I even checked it before I uploaded it, but you know, the format I was using supports footnotes. So they take this thing with working footnotes and basically destroy that information. And I'm like, you know, okay, the book's ready to go and I release it. And then it's not until people buy it. And that's the one thing I wanted to avoid. I spent so much time testing and testing and testing. And there were other annoyances. I was very careful. I spent all this time formatting the book. Like, it's really annoying when you have one line of text that, like, one sentence just spills onto the next page and that's all that's on the page, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or, y you know, two words and then a chapter heading or something like that. Just... Ugh, that's just and so I spent a lot of time fiddling with image sizes and nudging this and moving that and adjusting things so that it would so that that stuff wouldn't happen and then you know when Amazon adapted my book or whatever converted it to their format that was lost ah oh, what so, yeah so now people like are complaining that oh you you get to the end of a you know, there's two words and then a chapter heading, you know, a great big chapter or a section heading. You know how I do, like, in the middle of a document, it'll have a, you know, some some larger words and an image to, to denote a section. But there'll be two words at the top of the page and then a new section. Ugh. Or a image will get separated from its caption. I mean, I spent literally three days making sure that would never happen. And then it happened. Ah. Uh. This is why we have PDF. This is why people right. use PDFs all the time. Right, and this is supposedly a fixed format, which should avoid that. Like, here, this is what's on the page. Don't mess with it. Here is exactly what each page has, but no. So I'm replacing it with a flowing format document where it's going to be more like a web page that just like, well, whatever ones that winds up on the page winds up on the page. I mean, since yeah. that's what they're doing to it anyway. Yeah, I, I seem to remember using the Amazon ebook reader and I was frustrated because I would go to I would go to a page like there aren't page numbers. It's just like like you said, it's a flowing format, so it, it doesn't have like specific page numbers. It's just got like right indexes or something. It indexes by paragraph or I don't know how it does it. But I'd try to like go somewhere and then like go somewhere else in the book or whatever and then come back to where I was and it'd be like, Okay, well, like when I said come back to where I was, it would be like, okay, we're coming back to like that paragraph, but that paragraph is in a different spot on the page now. And so now I'm confused because right. I'm looking in the wrong part of the page and like, uh, right. It manages to be the worst of both worlds. Yeah. Cause it's not like a web page where you can just view the whole thing at once. Like you have to use pages, but then the pages aren't a fixed thing. And so now that text is moving around on the pages. So yeah, it is. It's just the worst. Why is this so bad? It can't be it can't be this hard.
Well, okay. Right? So the Why reason it's so, so bad, bad is because they've got multiple different readers and the readers need to have a minimum text size and need to be able to adjust the text size. And so you can't just have one page size and one font size. So they need right. to have a flowing format. But then they shouldn't accept fixed format inputs. They should just say, hey, look, give it to us as an HTML and we're going to strip all the formatting and do whatever we want with it. Like they shouldn't accept a PDF or whatever. I don't know what, how you're uploading it, but they shouldn't accept a fixed format input if if that's what they're actually doing. Right. It's weird and annoying. Anyway, there there will be I will be pushing an update on Sunday. Fingers crossed. Hopefully hopefully the foot there are over 200 footnotes throughout the book. So you really want the footnotes to work. You really don't want people to have to go to the very end of the book to see a footnote and then somehow find their way back. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And at least in a physical book, you can put your finger where you are. Like, and that's effort. Like, you can put a bookmark in an ebook, but that's more work. You'd like hold here, bring down the menu, mark this spot. And then once you get back, you, you know, clear that bookmark because you don't want to keep it around forever. Like, it's more in the digital format is less convenient than the printed format and that should never be true how hard do you have to work to make digital less convenient than physical that's ludicrous yeah it, to show how bad it was i started i started using the text search as my bookmark because the bookmarking was just a pain <laughs> and so i would just like copy a phrase of text and then like go to a link or go to the end of the book or go to, well one of the things is they had a map there was like this map this world map in the book that i was reading and so i wanted to refer to the map but it's way at the beginning of the book and so you have to like click back to the beginning of the book or whatever and and if you try to open two windows and be smart like that it's like oh oh now we're going to sync up your viewers so now like it will keep you at the place in the <laughs> book both. that you are They'll both and so be I click on the map spot. in one, and then it's like, oh, do you want us to sync up your view? Yes, you do. Of course you do. Here we are back at the map. I'm like, no, I didn't want you to do that. That's no, stop. So I would just copy the text, and then I would search for that text, and then it'd be like, here it is. And I'd be like, great, take me there. And then it'd be like, here you are. We found the, the only spot in this book where this text appears. It's like, oh, you guys. <sighs> Very disappointing. Yeah. But the, and I, I'm not getting much reception to the book. The reception to the video was very was much more positive than I thought. I was expecting lots of pushback, and no, everybody's like, "Yeah, everybody on YouTube." That that's what I was worried about. I expected outrage from YouTube, and I was okay with that. I mean, I know how things are. I know what people are like on Reddit, and so I was yeah. expecting a bit of a fanboy temper tantrum. But I think I think time has proven me right. <laughs> I think time has vindicated the critics. Yeah, it's good to see you got some some good traffic too. So I see here in the show notes you have Realm of the Bad Dog. What's this about? <laughs> yeah. So uh, a decade ago, uh, shortly after I was married, I believe my, my my wife picked up a game called Realm of the Mad God, and it was a like a little top down rogue light kind of thing um it had right. like a it had like isaac a, has a, played it i i played it i played it for like a couple hours isaac played it for a while like i don't know eight years ago or something he was into it for a while but yeah like yeah an M a roguelike mmo a right. top down right. 2d roguelike bullet hell mmo yes exactly and uh, and so I played it a little bit, you know, home from work or whatever. And she, when I was gone from work, at work, she would play it, you know. And, uh, so it was a it was a fun little game, and I think she ended up winning the game or whatever, you know, beating the Mad God. And uh, I may have come along with her on one of the raids or something. And it's a it's a little you know a miniature MMO. It's it's not extensive, but it's well made and you know put together. And so imagine my surprise when I was browsing around on Steam. I'm like, oh, you know, I should take a look at what games are available. Maybe I'll find something to talk about on the diecast. And lo and behold, Realm of the Mad God is free to play on Steam. And it's like, it's still a thing. There's still people playing it. Yeah. And that, that is pretty cool that it's just still there doing its thing. It looks like they've added pets and stuff. 
So there's some uh, and there's some sort of gold that you can use. And I think that was probably in place at the beginning. I don't know how much it's developed because I, I don't remember it very clearly, but um, the kids were playing it a little bit and they're like, oh, this is fun. Like, it's cool. You know, you can do, you know, run around and do stuff. They're always dying and creating new characters, which they're always creating new characters in games anyway. So it's, it's perfect. It's right. used to create new characters. Right. So I was charmed that this cute little gem of a game is still actually has traction. Well, swinging to the other extreme, we can talk about a brand new AAA game that came out this week. There we go. Biomutant. Now, this thing, I was charmed by it. I really liked the uh, premise where you kind of play as a little animal uh, with a big sword. Mm. I mean, I have like affinity. Rocket the raccoon. Exactly. But in Rocket the Raccoon crossed with like um I didn't play it, but what's the Zelda game where Breath of the Wild, where you're just running around an open world? Like hmm, okay. picture Rocket Raccoon running around a giant, slightly cartoonish open world filled with amp anthropomorphized animals. Okay. Good work. <laughs> and I have I have this soft spot in my heart for any time you have tiny characters with huge swords. Like, any time that M <laughs> MMO gives me the option, I'll pick the littlest, tiniest, little elfy girl and with the biggest weapon and combine the two. But little animal works too. Just tiny person, oversized weapon. I don't know why. It makes me happy. Sure. Like, the, the tinier and the cuter and the and the less threatening it looks like you know, most people playing mmos want to be you know they're like how can i look as much as possible like darth vader i just want to be this big evil helmeted faceless avatar of power in black and i'm always like i want to be ridiculous <laughs> i want to be absurd <laughs> so yeah yeah biomutant i nearly bought it I very nearly bought it, but then I decided to watch a stream of it before I put because it's full price. This is a sixty dollar game. Mm. Boy, am I glad I waited! Oh my goodness, I watched uh, Day Nine play it. No, oh, yeah. Um, and okay, for one thing, now, tell me if this sounds weird to you. Okay, you you open up your character creator or you start the game, and it asks well, you. Okay, to before allocate... you before you go into it. Before you go into it, I, I saw this in the show notes and I went and watched some of their promotional trailers on Steam just to kind of get a feel for the sure. game. And my impression, knowing nothing else about the game, is that their art director or maybe like game designer or someone who's in, like in charge of the overall game needs to learn to say no because there are too many different things happening in this game. There's too much. There's like, there's like some super realistic stuff there's some like uh bioshock stuff going on there's some beyond good and evil kind of thing and then yeah. there's like breath of the wild kind of thing and then they've got yep. some sort of like comic book like uh captions with it kind of feels like borderlands kind of thing and there there are too many different flavors in this particular fondue like you shouldn't have all those things those are all good flavors but don't put them all in the same pot so that's my impression go for it uh well i think you've nailed it yeah you need to say no i know i was attracted to it when i saw oh it kind of has batman type combat you know you dodge you see an enemy ha has some kind of tell that he's about to attack you you can counter him as he comes at you and that'll stun lock him and then you can either leave him there and take care of the other enemies, or you can take advantage of his stunned state to really mess him up. And so it's this juggling act. That's what I was like, oh, I really like this. Um, and uh, that's what I was in for. But okay, so you start a game, and it asks you right off the bat, what do you want your stats to be like? You know, your strength, dexterity, speed, luck. Okay? Hmm. You could just like pick any number or like you have to balance them out. Well, you got some you, points to spend or yeah, some point buy system. And then you choose what you look like. Okay. I can have, Oh look, I can have a smaller head or I can color myself pink or Oh, more fur here. Oh, you know, bigger bush, your tail here. Fine. 
fine. And then the sure. last screen is pick your class. Hmm. That immediately, like, uh, I, I was watching that and I went, what? And then Day9 went, what? <laughs> and I'm sure everybody in chat went, what? Like, you pick your class first. Like, am I a sword guy? Am I a, am I a, a gun guy? Am I a, a magic spell guy? You should always pick that first because that informs all your other subsequent decisions. Like, technically, after you've allocated, all right, I want lots of strength and endurance. Okay, well, that's the that's the tank class. You've essentially already selected your class. <laughs> and no one's asking you to select your class formally. It is a weird, dumb counter because you're like, oh, here are the classes. Oh, I understand. Now I understand all those points, all those stats I was buying <laughs> two screens ago. Now I understand why they're important. I guess I'll back up and redo all of that. So is this one of the things where it makes a suggestion for like, based on what you selected, this is probably the class you want? Or is it just kind of like, good luck, pick one of these? Yeah, I don't remember. I, I don't remember. And, uh. you know, that maybe it did, but, you know, I wasn't using the controller. I was watching somebody else. But Right, right. But then the Because I can imagine if your stat system is simple enough, like if you only got three stats, for example, then you could you could make a set of classes that cover all the combinations of those, right? Like high in one, high in two, high in these exactly. other two, right? There's only a certain number of combinations you can have. But if it's complicated, if it's like five or six stats, there's no way that you can ensure that the choices that the player made at the beginning are valid. Uh, unless right. the classes are really flexible in what they use. I don't, I don't know. It seems, yeah, that does seem really odd. Um, so that was weird. But then... This is, it feels like a very mechanics focused game, right? Where it's very much like Batman, very mechanics focused. Hmm. Dark Souls, very mechanics focused, as opposed to like an Uncharted or a Tomb Raider, which is all about cutscenes. And like the gameplay is just there to like buffer the cutscenes, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like this feels like a very mechanics fo focused game. But then there was so much story. It was, and um, all of it is conveyed by a single narrator. Now, the hmm. narrator's good. He, he actually sounds, a, I didn't look it up, but it sounds a lot like the guy from Stanley Parable. Oh, yeah. Uh, doing, yes, doing a slightly, oh, you're going to want to be careful when you go into these woods. You know, that kind of telling you, oh, there might be danger ahead. Best be careful. And that's cute. It's, it's but kind of like, a, a little bit of a director as well as a narrator. Right. But there's so much of it. And it was just like a fight and then a bunch of talking and then another fight and a bunch of talking and then another, like there was never two fights back to back. It was always fight and then a puzzle and then some cutscenes and then a conversation and then a fight and then a puzzle and then some platforming and then, and uh, really weird. And I like how you put it, that somebody needs to say no to the game de designer. The game is trying to do too many things at once. Um, and the game is terrified of that you will not understand what's going on. They were like, okay, we're going to make this game that has all of the ingredients of every open world game out there right now. All the popular mechanics. It's all going in. And we're going to design this game this incredibly mainstream AAA game, and we're going to make sure that the tutorial is tailored to somebody who has never played a video game before. <laughs> I just couldn't get over how much time it spent explaining the idea, concept, and possible consequences of the morality system. Like, the very start of the game, it has you pick whether you want to befriend the evil spirit or the good spirit, which are both components of you. Like, they, they pop out of your body, the, the classic devil on your shoulder, angel on your shoulder, kind of manifest in front of you. You pick one of them. 
Like, oh, I, I guess I just decided I'm going to be evil for this entire playthrough. But then it gives you a, a situation where you can choose to do good or evil. And then it gives you a tribe where you can choose to side with the incredibly obviously evil tribe or the incredibly obviously virtuous tribe. And every time you do this, it feels the need to explain what the choice you're making is and that there might be consequences later. <laughs> it, it's like, what? Oh, no. Why are you explaining the idea of a morality? I mean, a morality system is the one thing that you can, okay, even if you are, even if you were Amish and you've left your Amish community and have joined the technological world with the rest of us and you have no prior experience playing video games and you've never seen a morality system, that's okay. It's okay for you to discover that. Oh, wow, these guys don't want to deal with me because I've been evil. Okay, that's an interesting twist in this video game that I've never played before. Like, there's sure, no... Sure, but you'd probably, be, you'd probably be in a better position because most people who've played video games are used to their moral decisions being ignored by the game because the game doesn't usually take that into account. So right. you'd probably expect it to do that. Right, so the idea that the game is going out of its way to, like, triple explain this incredibly familiar mechanic that doesn't need to be explained at all. Um, and the other thing that drives me crazy is they have a made-up language in the game. so mm. Or maybe multiple. So you go up to some guy and he's an anthropomorphized weasel or whatever, and he just talks in gibberish. And it's very silly. Okay, I would expect that to be subtitled. Like, I just understand weasel. All right? and it's But no. It lets that line play out, and then the narrator translates, Ah, he says there's something he wants you to get for him. So you can imagine, like, that's <laughs> Wait doubling... A minute. <laughs> it's doubling the number of voice lines that you... Like, no, okay, the, the dialogue is already... There's too much of it. Like, this is a simple conversation. You are making an incredibly simple choice. And there's way too much dialogue, and all of it's said twice, once in nonsense and then once translated by the narrator. That is like the worst, that is the most expensive option as the game developer. That, that is the maximum amount of work, while being also the maximum cost to the player in terms of how much of your time are you going to eat. You know, this sounds like it's not a game designed to be interesting or fun to play. It sounds like a game that's been designed to be expensive to produce so that the guy funding the game can like pay all of his buddies to do all this stuff. <laughs> right? Is this, is this some sort of money laundering scheme? It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous and the combat looks fun. What little combat I saw in the two hour stream I watched. Oh, but my wow. goodness. But my goodness, it just like, it wanted to talk all the time and it had so little to say and what it did have to say was so not interesting. And it was very heavy handed, like, okay, this is obviously after some sort of ecological disaster, humans killed themselves off and by, you know, polluting the environment or whatever and the animals took over and they're all mutated now based on our pollution. And the game needs to explain this to us and explain to us how foolish those humans were. And it's like, <laughs> uh, wouldn't it be more interesting if it was, if you had dramatic irony, like it's already going to be obvious to the human playing the game, what caused this disaster, but that the animals thought that this was deliberate. You know, and the animals were like, oh, humans are so, we're so clever. They invented all this stuff that made us happen. Like anything, but having them be sanctimonious towards human. Boy, are they foolish. Like that is the least interesting choice you can make. There's no, oh, there's nothing wow. to do with it. There's, there's no tension there. There's no interest. There's no humor. There's no charm. It's just humans are dumb. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't like it when a game panders to the audience, but like just blatantly insulting the audience isn't good either. Right. Also, I mean, if you're bitching about how humans are being wasteful, 
I don't know of all the things we produce that are wasteful, video games have got to be kind of high on that list. <laughs> like, of all the stuff we make that we don't need, <laughs> video games are pretty high up there. Yep. Why don't you bulldoze your game development studio and plant some crops? Get off your friggin' high horse. Turn into an animal sanctuary. Right? Save some species. You know, capture some carbon, what, whatever. Um, so I put up I put up a link to uh, an article. I don't remember if I mentioned on the show notes, but I some months ago, over a year ago now, I wrote a review of Shadow of the Conqueror. And um, I was just reminded twice now in the show. So I wanted to put a link up because that was the book that I read on Amazon. And then right. also... Is that the one feels... by Shed? Is that Shed Versity yeah. guy? Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Shadiversity guy. I, I think I did mention on the show before. Oh, yeah, you definitely did. We had this conversation. Anyway, I, it reminded me of Biomutant also because it felt like that thing was like throwing too many things in and like not being able to, to rein yourself in and like, oh, and this would be a cool thing. Oh, and this would be a cool thing. It's like, oh, you got to... You got to pare that down at some point. You got to have a theme. You got to have a through line somewhere. And also the sanctimoniousness of it. It's just like, oh, this has the same feel of like the guy who was running this game also was like a similar kind of guy to Shad, I think. It just, it feels that way. Right. Right. And it just feels, ugh. And not only is it making its point in the least interesting way, like, oh, humans are dumb and pollution is bad. But then it over explains that it needs to like it hits that note several times and the narrator joins in it's not that the characters join. even the narrator is like oh those foolish humans left this mess for you and it's like Ugh, that's so not interesting <laughs> like can you imagine okay here's you come upon a character that's uh, destroyed themselves with drug abuse and you're like gonna help them and then the narrator's like this person has made some unwise choices in their life it's like i know what kind of choices they made do you think i'm stupid <laughs> do you need to condescend to me i understand what's going on i understand that this person has hurt themselves with poor decision making how little respect do you have for the audience that you feel the need to explain such a thing that's amazing absolutely no confidence just no confidence in the audience once whatsoever for their ability to parse even the slightest bit of nuance oh so overly verbose and heavy-handed i wanted i wanted to love this game but boy the two-hour stream i watched just made it look tedious man we were hoping to get to some mailbags this week are we gonna we're gonna sprint through them here Oh my gosh, did I just... We burned through three quarters of the show already? How did that... Where does the time go? Oh my goodness. All right, yeah, let's do some mailbags. Dear 13 Window and Paul, Game at the Bottom design where most of the real gameplay happens is in your cooldown base bar has been extremely popular since at least World of Warcraft. It seems to be almost exclusive to the realm of MMOs, etc., etc., I haven't found it outside in single-player games. Is there a reason why this only exists in MMOs? Is there something about the MMO style? 93. Thank you, 93. What do we think about that? All right. Uh, the the game at the bottom design with a, a hot bar with lots of cooldowns is... I've always maintained a very boring design, but it's very forgiving of lag. It is incredibly right. forgiving. Latency. If you're lagging. Yeah, latency. So... It's the optimal design if you're making an MMO that needs to run in 1997, you know, the internet of 97. <laughs> and or even, uh, even... connect people from across the globe where they have to be on the same server even though they're continents apart. Right, right. And even today, you know, you can still have latency problems. Sure, like most of the Western world um, has low enough latency that we can do more actiony stuff. But even today, you'll find developed, perfectly good developed countries that have the bandwidth, but not the latency, right? Like, it's just for whatever mm -hmm. reason, they're, you know, 
maybe because it has to go through the great sensor wall or whatever it is, there's something that introduces like this baseline unavoidable 150 milliseconds overhead everywhere. So the game needs to be like really forgiving. And I think the fact that we don't see this in single player games is proof that this is a fundamentally uninteresting design and is a necessity of latency and not like something that people love. That's my take on hot bar based combat. Yeah, I, I always wondered why the hot bar based stuff wasn't automated. So you could just like tell your character, do these things and then like sit back and have a Coke or whatever. Right. Automated. Okay. Just walk up to the monster, do this power. If it's on cooldown, then do this power. If that's on cooldown, then do this power. And if that, and if they're all on cooldown, do nothing, stand there. And when the enemy dies, loot it and then walk forward 20 feet and find another enemy. And then when you kill the, and then just repeat the process. Then when you kill it, turn around and go back to the first enemy because it will have respawned. Great. I've just written a script and I'll be back in six hours when I hit level 10. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. have like a KSB style fast forward thing where you can just be like, all right, do that for 20 years. Right. Yeah, not super interesting. The, the the interesting stuff for me in an MMO was always like, oh, this place looks cool. Because, you know, they have usually big budgets and they can make great, big, fantastical environments that are great. You know, it's a theme park. It's a great, big theme park. And that I like. Yeah. And WoW was the best theme park. Other games kind of like weren't as interesting. Like, oh, here's a cool purple forest okay here's a dreary spooky ha halloween themed forest oh okay here we're doing like an orange motif of like harvest time um nobody everybody else wants to like make stuff realistic which means all your wilderness is green and all your cities are the color of concrete and it's like well that's not as yeah. exciting yeah the art direction blizzard's always been great at art direction always amazing all right Dear Diecast, so apparently Aspire is now remaking KOTOR. Could be cool. I wish there were some screenshots or something to show the proposed style of the remake. I realize this is about a month old at this point, but I didn't see it until now. Jennifer Snow. Well, it's probably about two months old at this point because this has been... Yeah, we're behind on the mailbag. <laughs> so, a KOTOR remake. That's interesting. Um... I don't know. How's that going to work? KOTOR is a classic and I love it, but there are a lot of things about it that absolutely do not fly in today's world. That tutorial being like four hours long, the tutorial planet being four hours long is insufferable to modern players. Like Terrace takes forever. And also a lot of the mechanics have been developed into genre staples at this point so oh, right. like it's not like they're innovating anymore either so you wouldn't really need a, a tutorial that long i mean unless you yeah. wanted to i guess right and the the combat in this game is actually been deprecated like this is this is back when your character, you had a character sheet and it all talked about, oh, you know, you plus one to your dodge rolls. And so your attacks yeah. all happen on a D4s timer. and D20s and stuff. Right. And that's all happening in the background. And then game developers realized that, wait, that's only accessible to people coming from tabletop games, which is a minority of other, of all players. And to everyone else, this stuff is plus what this, when we say plus one to your dodge roll, 80% of the players have no idea what that means. They don't know what the benefit is. We need to like, we can keep those mechanics if we want, but let's explain it in some way that's comprehensible to everybody else. And hey, why do we have it going on a timer? We're not sitting at a table. We can just have them press buttons to make attacks happen when they press the buttons. And that feels way better. So a Mass Effect, the first Mass Effect was actually the, the turning point. You know, this was uh, Bioware made KOTOR, and then they made Mass Effect. And I think between those two games, or jumping from one to the other, I forget what other titles were, or in between those two. But, like, that era is when we went through that transition of, oh, we're just going to pretend this is a tabletop game being medi mediated by a computer, to the point where we were like, 
oh no, th this is just a video game, an action video game. And by Mass Effect 2, it was just, oh, this is just a shooter now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't know. What, what do you do when you're going to remake it? Where on that spectrum do you aim? Are you going to go back to the tabletop thing? Or are you going to go for action game? Are you going to re-record all those lines? That's expensive. Or are you going to keep all the dialogue? It says I mean, it's it's a full remake, so it, they're not taking anything from the the old game. I'm assuming, except for the themes and the maybe the story. Hmm. I don't know if that. I don't know if that's smart. I don't know. A remake gives you the shield. If somebody's like, "Oh, this feels dated," everybody's like, "Well, it's a remake." But if you're remaking everything from the ground up, I don't know. I don't know. I'll be it looks very like they're trying to combine KOTOR 1 and KOTOR 2 as well, or, or drawing from them. Maybe they're just drawing from them for, for inspiration. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'll definitely play it, but I fear that a modern audience will not dig it. Because modern audiences would... will not, Modern mainstream audiences are not looking for the KOTOR experience. Sales trends have, you know, kind of demonstrated that over the last 20 years. <laughs> That's the reason we're not getting more games like that. Yeah. Well, there's still some demand for it. Maybe they'll find a niche. Here's hoping. Dear DieCast, could you share some of your favorite adventure game moments? Mine is the showdown with death in King's Quest VI. It's only a minute or two long. It combines good writing, good voice acting, beautiful art. Wishing you all the best. Bobbert. Bobbert. Thank you, Bobbert. So I've got a few. I couldn't pick one. Um, my Some of my favorite moments. Um, one is Space Quest 4 and 6 were voiced by Gary Owens. Um, you know him as the voice from Laughin. And his voice is magic. His voice is just pure humorous joy. Everything he said in that announcer voice was hilarious so i can't pick a specific moment from those games it was just this constant giggling as he described your the ridiculous world using his humorous voice second moment yes. that i love from adventure games is when you get captured by the natives in monkey island and there's a hole in the floor of the hut so they shove you into a hut to hold you prisoner and they nail the door shut so then you escape and you go back into the village and they're like, oh, somehow you got out. So they shove you back in there. But this time they chain the door closed and then you go out through the hole in the floor and you there's a puzzle to go. You're supposed to be figuring out like you're supposed to go get out, go do something, solve a puzzle and then come back and deal with them. But if you're just like being stupid or just wandering around, you can keep wandering back into the village and they're like, oh, you got out again. So they throw you back in the back in the prison, and this time they have a steel door that they've somehow crafted. And if you keep doing this, <laughs> then eventually it becomes a giant high-tech bank vault door that says armed <laughs> on it. <laughs> and uh, that one, that gag, it's a slight gag, but it had me laughing until I cried. Because every time I got captured, I mean, once I realized the pattern, I deliberately kept getting captured to see how far the joke would go. And it made me so happy. Um, also, in Secret of Monkey Island, insult sword fighting is one of the most inspired game mechanics ever done. You played this game, right, Paul? Yes. I, I, I don't think I ever played it all the way through, but I have... I have played Monkey Island for some hours. Right. And insult sword fighting is a brilliant gag, a brilliant game mechanic, and a brilliant puzzle, and a wonderful narrative device. It is totally Yeah, and brilliant. it fits with the world building so well, and it's just the yes. whole, it's, just, it's perfect. Right. I, I love it that you get in a deadly fight in which nobody ever dies. <laughs> um, and, like, you have to gather vocabulary... Which is like for an adventure game, like because and that's kind of like a play on the old adventure games where you had to actually figure out what word to type in, and so like you were literally right. gathering vocabulary there, and so it's like this jab at the history of the genre as well. It's just ah, oh, so good on so many levels. And one more, also 
in Secret of Monkey Island. Secret of Monkey Island is one of the greatest is one of the greatest adventure games ever made. The other one is if you, you get up on the top of a mountain and you're up on this flat place on top of the mountain and you can see the whole island below you. But if you just happen to walk to the tip of this rock outcropping, suddenly it breaks off and you plummet to your death. And uh, you get this screen was like, oh no, you died. Which is really weird and disorienting. It's okay. The thing is, in Monkey Island, you can't actually die. There is no game over screen. But Sierra games were famous for just murdering you for no reason. Just, oh, you took a bad step. Oh, you came into this room without the right item. You died. You died. You died. And so you just save scum. You're just constantly saving all the time. Monkey Island didn't do that. Right. But then it had this one gotcha death it's like oh no you're dead you know for some reason you couldn't have even predicted hope you saved recently and then and then your character bounces back up into into view just like rockets back out of the jungle and lands safely on the ground and he's like oh, i landed on a rubber tree <laughs> and the and the <laughs> and the dialogue box the sierra style the very deliberately sierra style oops do you want to restore the game or restart that just vanishes so it was just basically giving the finger to sierra games so those those are my right. favorite moments right they're they're like hey we could have done this too but we didn't cuz we're not jerks <laughs> right cuz we want you to have fun we're not we're not trying to beat you the game's the the win state for the game designer is when you're having fun, not when you die. Right. Which is which is really interesting though, because Bobbert's favorite scene is this culmination in in King's Quest Six. It's like the the boss fight basically, and you have to have these specific items that you've gathered from other quests elsewhere in the game, and you have to know which ones to use, and you have to do it just right and like if you don't you just die like you're talking to death and he's just like uh if you do the wrong thing i'm gonna kill you right it's basically like the sierra death in like personified right. personified yes he is a, he should just be that dialogue box restore restart <laughs> right but but um, for some people that's like that's the the secret sauce that's what they wanted in an adventure game so like hey Right. For me, it was, I played, um, I played my first Lucas game. My first Lucas Arts games was, you know, there were the two houses and I didn't know it back in the day. I didn't understand. I just bought things that I thought looked interesting and I wasn't really into games. So I didn't get a lot, you know, I'd buy one or two games. I'd buy like one game a year. Right. Right. I didn't it's like when you're a real little kid and you're watching these animated movies and you're like, oh, these are really good. You don't know they're all made by Disney. Right. Or you don't know these are all Steven Spielberg. Sure. Yeah, exactly. You you don't know. So you just sort of like, oh, I didn't like this one as much. And it's like, you know, well, that's Ooh Bowl. <laughs> so um, so uh, just randomly, I bought Secret of Monkey Island. And then I realized this is the adventure game I've always wanted. And I never wanted to go back to Sierra games again. I mean, I did. But, uh, like, I was like, this is so much better. Why did Sierra waste so many years making that crap when they could have been making this? And it really start, got me started thinking about game design and design philosophy. Hmm. Yeah. 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 So from so Secret of Monkey Island is is an incredibly important game for me. Sort of understanding the hobby. And... Yeah, three of my greatest adventure game moments happened in that one game. And if we were to if we were to expand that list to my top five, I'll bet you like four out of my top five moments would still be in that list. Would still be from that game. Yeah. Oh, it's such a it's such a beautiful beacon of light in that otherwise kind of miserable genre. Right. A genre, I mean, early in the development of the I, I don't fault them for the early games, right? But they sure, kind of yeah. spent the whole 80s stuck in that rut. And that was perhaps too long to not innovate. And everybody else was like figuring out what was fun. And Sierra was just still doing the same thing. The most unforgivable death is in, um, sp it's in the Space Quest series. At one point you're running around this big, um, 
alien space station, right? And the alien from aliens, this creature obviously based on the alien xenomorph, right? Walks up to you. And if you don't run away, um, it picks you up and kisses you. And it, you know, the dialogue box like come, pops up, ha ha. And you, oh, it gives you a big smooch on the lips. And you're like, ooh, gross. But then it walks away. And then you play the game for several more hours. And then just as you yes. get near the ending, as you get near the ending, a chest burster comes out of your stomach and kills you. And the and you have I hope you have a save from, you know, two hours ago before the before you got kissed by that alien. Yes. That was not cool. It's <laughs> it's funny in it's funny it, in It concept. never happened to me, so it's funny to me. But yeah, that's right. just wrong. Right. It's just that's a horrible thing to do to players. Um, oh, it's awful. Awful. It's a funny concept for a joke. It's a funny thing if it's something you chose to do. If the alien was locked in somewhere and no puzzle told you to go into this room and you deliberately went into the room and kissed, voluntarily kissed it yourself, like it wanted to kiss you and you're like, oh, sure, kiss it. And then later it killed you. That would kind of be forgivable for... You know, right. what were you doing? You were just going around it's, doing random shit. It's a funny joke if you're like, alien kisses you, then there's like the transition scene with a French guy saying, two hours later, and then the chest right. burster happens. Like, <laughs> right. But if it's actually two hours, it's not funny anymore. It's just like, really? Seriously? You, you did that to me? Like, now I have to do all of that over again? Right. Instead... Yeah, especially since so many players just saved in the same slot all the time. Because, like, who wants all the bookkeeping of maintaining a ro a rotating series of backups? Should I date them? Yeah, well, and, like, two hours, yeah, two hours of backups? Like, how many save slots were there? How much memory right. did your computer have at the time? Right. Oh, it was so brutal. <sighs> oh, well. Well, we didn't get the the mailbag done but we came close we've probably caught up to you know last week's at least yes we did yes we did well thanks to everybody who sent in questions if you've got a question for the show our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com uh yeah thanks for those great questions say goodbye paul have a good holiday weekend oh no this comes out after the holiday weekend okay well hope you had a good uh, 